These are my disclosures. The intestinal microbiome harbors the highest density of bacteria in any location on the planet. That is the mammalian gut. We have as many bacterial cells living in and on our body as we have human cells. So we are actually ecosystems walking around. The surface of the GI tract, if you were to spread it out, is actually the size of two tennis courts. And the intestine is also the largest lymphoid organ in the body by raw numbers of lymphocytes. And so we have this incredible meeting of the immune system and enormous numbers of bacteria separated by just one thin layer of epithelium. So our immune systems are really maintaining homeostasis or an equilibrium balance with the bacteria that we co-evolved with. And you can interpret many immune reactions as perturbations from that equilibrium. After bone marrow transplantation for leukemia or lymphoma, there are four main causes of death. Relapse, graft versus host disease, where the donor immune system attacks the patient's body, infections and organ toxicities. Each of these outcomes have been associated with the composition of the gut microbiota. Here's a phylogenetic tree of different gut bacteria that we have found in allo transplant patients. And those that are associated with good outcomes are color-coded in blue, and those associated with negative outcomes are color-coded in red. We've found associations in the past with overall survival, with GVHD, with infections, with organ toxicity, and even with relapse. Now, this represents 10 years of work approximately in both mouse models and human studies. Today, I'd like to tell you about uh, a different time of measuring or characterizing the contents of the gut microbiota, which is just before the transplant. Most of this work that I'm showing you here in the last 10 years was done studying the microbiota in the few weeks after the transplantation. This, is, this project was done in close collaboration with colleagues at Duke University in North, in, uh, in North Carolina, Hokkaido in Japan, uh, and Regensburg in Germany, and Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, our institution at North, at, in New York. Here, this is a Tisney projection of several thousand stool samples. Each dot is a stool sample, and its composition, the bacteria that are found in it, are represented by where it is in this cluster of dots. So similar samples are close together, and dissimilar samples are far apart. These are pre-transplant samples collected from patients at these four centers. And they're color-coded by which institution they came from. And what's striking here is that the dots are all mixed in together. It's not as if, say, all the green dots are in one corner and all the red dots are in another. So this indicates that no matter where you come, no matter where you live around the world, when you come for a bone marrow transplant, the composition of your gut flora is comparable from center to center. Now what happens during the transplantation? This is the diversity which counts basically how many different bugs you have in your gut. And during the transplant, at all four centers, there's a striking drop in diversity. This is a major insult to the health of the flora uh, that's not seen in many other clinical scenarios. And uh, well, in the past, we've shown that low diversity here uh, at this time when the stem cells are engrafting is associated with poor outcomes after transplantation. We've shown that in a single center study. We asked here, what if we look earlier in the transplant course before the stem cells are administered, before the pre-transplant chemotherapy is administered, at the time when treatment decisions are being made. And what we found is that even, even uh, at this early time point, where patients are in this diversity plot can predict their outcome. So that patients with low diversity pre-transplant have a poor overall survival than patients with a high diversity after transplantation. The implication is if we could come up with a way to remediate microbiome injury, there might be time to implement it before the transplant. Another way to measure a gut microbiome injury, besides calculating the diversity, is looking at a phenomenon that we find in our patients that we term monodomination, where instead of hundreds of different bacteria growing in the gut, 
A third, or in some cases 95 plus percent of the bacteria in an individual's intestine are all the exact same strain. So here we define monodomination as any, any time that one bacterium accounts for 30% or more of the gut composition, which is a very unusual scenario in people walking around eating a normal diet and uh, not being exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics. And we can see that the incidence and the prevalence of this monodomination phenotype is strikingly similar at all four centers. Even though each of these centers uses different antibiotic strategies. The people in Japan have a diet that's different than the people in the United States, but the patterns of microbiome injury are nearly superimposable. This here that shows which bacteria account for the different, um, the different monodomination events. And I'll point out to you that studies from animals suggest that the T cells, which cause graft-versus-host disease, that have just been infused, migrate to the gut as early as day two or three after the transplant. And by that time, already 50% of patients have experienced a monodomination event in their guts. So the milieu, the environment that the donor immune system is encountering as it comes into the recipient patients is already seeing a damaged gut. Now, what about the post-transplant setting? Here we find that also, as in the pre-transplant setting, after the patient has recovered from the first phase of the bone marrow transplant, and the donor cells have set up shop and started making their own new white blood cells. We call this the perineutrophil engraftment period. Again, the diversity at the perineutrophil engraftment period is predictive of survival, and here we see this reproducibly at three different centers. So where can we go from here? Well, there are different strategies to try to remediate or prevent microbiome damage. One strategy might be a probiotic, and that could be something that's available on the shelf, or perhaps a rationally designed probiotic where we make something with just the right strains that we figure out are the right ones. You could try a prebiotic approach where you might give a patient a food that promotes the growth of a healthful bacteria, of a, a good bacterium. Or perhaps you could use a, a postbiotic approach where if we can discern which metabolite the bacteria produce that are giving a salient effect, a salutary effect, perhaps we could just give that metabolite, which may be uh, an attractive strategy in an immunocompromised patient. And finally, we can uh, think about different antibiotic strategies to use or not use different types of antibiotics at different times in a rational way. So the bottom line is these are different strategies that are in development. This is where many fields are going, and we're trying to take bone marrow transplantation in this direction as well. And the abstract that we're presenting in this conference indicates that you could try to deploy these strategies either after neutrophil engraftment or before the transplant in a clinical trial. So again, in conclusion, microbiota injury, including loss of diversity and enterococcal domination, occur across geography. The association of diversity with overall survival is reproducible over time and across geography. And microbiota diversity is predictive of overall survival when sampled either pre hematopoietic cell transplant, or at the time of neutrophil engraftment. As I mentioned, this work uh, was mentored, well, excuse me, was done in collaboration with colleagues at Duke, Regensburg, and Hokkaido, and my mentor, Marcel Vandenbrink, and my uh, computational biologist co-author, Antonio Gomez. Thank you very much. <laughs>